It was a strange Saturday afternoon. There was so much going on, and we really wanted to stay with the other members of our group, but we had to return back to our family in Emmaus. Some of our friends had told us this really weird story about an angel appearing in an empty tomb and the missing body of our friend Yeshua. And there was a missing body, all right. Peter himself attested to the fact that Yeshua was no longer in the grave. But the men did not believe the women when they said that Yeshua had raised to life. Perhaps they thought that the grief had caused the women to experience some hallucinations. So we continued to grieve. We had just began to come to terms with the fact that Yeshua was loud. It had been a long, hard weekend, and the Passover had ended. We had to return to our lives, so we packed up and began our long journey home. We walked together in silence until we were joined by a strange man. But I don't know if strange is the word I would use to describe him. He was attractive and welcoming, which made it easy for us to invite him to walk with us. And then he opened his mouth and began explaining the scriptures to us. Why the Messiah had to suffer and die. As he spoke, it felt like there was a fire set in our hearts. Every word he said lit up flames of excitement within us like fireworks. His words were true and we knew it in our hearts. When we returned back to Emmaus, it only made sense to invite him in for dinner. And then it happened. He took the bread and blessed it. He broke the bread and gave it to us just like he had done so many times before. Immediately I fell to my knees. He was the one. I could see him. I could touch him. Our friend Yeshua was not dead. He was alive. And the funniest thing is, is that he came to me, the most unlikely of followers. He came to me. He came to us, for us. And he came for you too. It had been a few days since the women brought us the news. Our friend was not dead. He had risen. And while this was the most exciting news I've ever heard, I I could feel the warmth of fear rising in my throat. I remember the way he looked at me in the comp room, and I knew that he knew that I had been him. And so I pondered my news. As everyone else followed him to the foot of the cross, I hid my face because I was ashamed. We saw him a few times. I was ecstatic. I wanted him to know I was sorry, but I was too afraid. I concluded that I was no longer worthy to be a fisher of men as he and so I returned to what I knew, be a fisherman and a fish. And then it happened again. Just like the first day I met him, he sent us out into the sea after a night of catching up fish. And miraculously, our nets were filled with more fish than we could handle. And by this point, I couldn't help myself any longer. I ran to him, and he didn't turn me away. We shared a delicious breakfast on the beach. I guess I was waiting for him to express his anger and send me away. I had abandoned him when he needed me most. <laughs> but instead, he called me by my name. Simon Peter, he asked me, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And I wept. 
You see, I had made mistakes, and I had disappointed him. But deep in my heart, I knew that I did love him more than anything else. If you love me, Peter, then feed my legs. Feed my sheep. Me? Have you forgotten so quickly? Me, the traitor? The denial? The failure? How can you trust me to lead anyone? I was done fishing for people. Who could I be? But then, I looked in his eyes and saw that he loved me despite everything that I had done. And all of my mistakes. He loved me and saw me worthy. And I loved him back. It's time. He is risen. He is risen. It is so good to be together this morning celebrating this gift of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. Thanks be to God that the tomb is empty. And friends, death does not have the final word in our lives. Even better, Easter is not a one and done occasion, right? It's not simply a Sunday morning sunrise service or a plate full of deviled eggs or that snazzy pastel bow tie that you got to bust out on Sunday morning. In fact, there are seven whole weeks of the church calendar that are devoted solely to Easter. Our forebears in faith had the wisdom to know that we need more than just one Sunday for the realities of Easter to sink down deep within us. We need more than just one Sunday to practice living as resurrected people. And so we enter now into this Easter season a season dedicated to the practice of the resurrected life. A season where our old lenses for the world are swapped out in order that we might instead see the world and see ourselves as Christ sees us. A redeemed people. A redeemed world. I love the vision painted in Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And skipping ahead to verse 19, Isaiah says, See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, I am doing a new thing. That's the core of the Easter story, right? I imagine a winding path making its way forward in a wilderness that was once dense and underbrush, impassable waters and unforgiving terrain. I imagine streams of life-sustaining water in the midst of a dry and barren desert. Vivid depictions of life from places of chaos and death. This is why the resurrection matters for, for our individual lives, for the systems of our societies, and for the health and vibrancy of the created world. Because of Jesus, there is a new thing at work all around us. I think we saw that this morning in the monologues that were shared with us. Two different encounters with the risen Jesus that, that give us a little window into what resurrected life could look like. Two examples of the ways in which God is making all things new, straight paths to follow in the wilderness, life quenching water in the desert. And so our service opened today with one of the travelers on the road to Emmaus from Luke 24. It's one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. If you haven't read it lately, I would encourage you to do so. It's late in the day on Sunday, less than 24 hours after the re resurrection. And contrary to what our Easter Sundays might have looked like, uh, Jesus' followers haven't spent the day brunching and decorating eggs and saying he is risen indeed. Quite the contrary, in fact. They're confused. They're shocked. They're unsure of what to believe. 
Their, their hearts and their conversations were filled with questions. Didn't we see him die? Where is his body? Did the women really encounter a risen Jesus? It was all that anyone could talk about. And so their confusion was only perpetuated when they, they met this seemingly uninformed stranger on the road. Friends, I find that I deeply resonate with those travelers on the road to Emmaus. I don't know if you do. So often in our journey with Jesus, we can feel like we are walking alone. We are confused and discouraged by things going on around us. We feel as if no one understands and as if we have lost our way, as if our destination is unclear. Where there maybe once felt like a, a deep-seated plan and purpose and a way forward in our lives, we can find ourselves feeling lost and unsure. And yet, here's the reality. That even when we don't recognize it, Jesus is always walking alongside of us. Jesus is present, ready and eager and, and waiting to enter into conversation with us. Willing and ready to, to pour light on the ways in which God has been at work through all of human history. On the ways in which God is at work in each of our own respective stories. If only we were postured and ready to receive him. If only we were listening and looking and ready to walk with our new traveling companion. And then there was our dear friend, Peter. Passionate, impulsive. Uh, throughout the Gospels, the, the first one to declare his love for Jesus or to step out onto the water. And yet, as Peter reflected for us today, the same one also who, who did not stay up to pray with Jesus, who explicitly denied him three times. It's not hard to imagine that, that Peter would beat himself up for these mistakes. That his internal critic would be louder than the voice of his rabbi after, after the events of Good Friday and moving through the silent dismay of Holy Saturday. And, and even though in John 21, Jesus had already appeared to the disciples multiple times, it's easy to imagine that Peter still finds himself hindered by fear and, and hesitation and doubt. And yet... Peter's story demonstrates that nothing, nothing can stand between us and the love of Jesus. If the outright denial from Peter can be forgiven, then nothing from our lives can create this insurmountable divide between us and our Savior. And not only is this, but, but as Jesus extends his hand of relationship to Peter, Jesus also invites Peter into leadership through service, right? To feed and to care for his sheep. Likewise, because of the Easter story, because of the resurrection, a way is made not only for our restoration, but also for our purpose. And I'm not saying that we're all called to the same path that, that Peter was, but I do believe that there is a story that God is writing through each of our lives. And that each of us is called in all of our uniqueness to embody the love of God to the world in a way that only we are positioned and postured to do so. And so, friends, this morning, I wonder, what does the resurrected life look like for you? Whether you are new or newer to this endeavor of faith, or if you've been walking with Jesus for a very long time, what pieces of these stories strike a chord within you? How are you today being invited into a new and fresh embodiment of resurrection living? How can you, how can I take steps in the coming days and weeks of this Easter season to continue journeying with faithfulness as a Christ follower? So right now, I actually want to give you a few minutes to think about those questions. There'll be a few prompts on the screen as well. You're welcome to use them as starting points or to feel free to listen to whatever the Spirit is stirring up within you. So you'll see them up on the screen behind me. Like, like the travelers on the road to Emmaus. What places of pain, confusion, or disbelief do you need Jesus to breathe new life into? Or like Peter in John 21. Where are you being invited 
to let go of the voice of the inner critic and instead hear the, the redeeming and the restoring voice of your Savior. Or maybe simply, what impact does a risen Jesus have on your day-to-day -day life? So I'm going to give you a few minutes here. I uh, just invite you to, to think about those questions, to pray, or just to be still, uh, knowing that, that God's presence is here with us this morning. Holy and loving God, as a community, we come before you this morning, and we know that we're coming from all different spaces and places when it comes to our relationship with you. And God, I just pray for those sacred spaces that were named or considered in prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, would you fan into flame this work of being an Easter people, a resurrected people? God, we pray and know that we need to lean on you to live in this way you're calling us to live, but we know that you go before us. So God, would you raise up community in those places where we need others to, to come alongside of us in faith? God, we're just so grateful for who you are, for who you are in our lives, for how you redeem and restore and make all things new. So God, when we find ourselves in those places of discouragement or doubt, God, when that inner critic is loud in our ears, remind us, remind us that you are doing a new thing, that we are not beholden to those old ways anymore, God. We love you. We pray these things in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen. A good chunk of my Easter Sunday was spent planting a new vegetable garden with my family. It felt like an appropriate embodiment of resurrection life as we planted these tiny seeds and vegetable starts into the soil. But just like Easter Sunday, growing this garden is not a one and done thing. Nurturing new life requires care and attention. Good soil, plant food, weeding, sun, protection from disease, faithful irrigation. Despite all of our best intentions, our new garden will not simply grow and thrive on its own, especially when the toddler occasionally picks things a little too soon. <laughs> Similarly, friends, the new life within each of us requires care and attention. It requires time to be with God. It requires surrounding ourselves with community. It requires uh, seeking out opportunities to serve and, and to be involved in causes of justice. It requires spiritual practices to sustain us. Despite all of our best intentions, our resurrection life will not simply grow and thrive on its own. And so SPU community, whatever it is that God laid on your heart during that time of reflection, during this time of worship, I hope that you'll take time and attention to continue nurturing those spaces of growth into life. And so now, resurrected people, I invite you to stand as you are able as we continue to worship together. God, you are so good. God, I thank you for the ways that you have loved us and cared for us and the ways that we have seen and in the ways that are unseen, God. And God, it brings me great peace to know that you are at work even in the all of all the stuff going on in my life. And I know that you are doing the same in each person's life here. And we trust that Jesus, you who conquered death, brings new life in these places that feel like there's often not new life. And so I pray that you would allow that to flourish and to grow. Jesus, you remind us of these words. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. I will send a helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. The Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let your hearts not be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus reminded us that he is the true vine and the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in Christ that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, Jesus prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. God, I thank you that it's something that you have done for us, not something that we could earn or merit. And then you reminded the disciples and you remind us, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. So God, I pray that you would grow this fruitful life in us and that when we need your help, Spirit, which is always, that Spirit, you would grow and flourish this in us and that Spirit, you would be our great comforter when we need you and that you would sustain us and uphold us. God, I thank you for this beautiful community that we can walk with one another, trusting you, Jesus, in all of these things. Help us to live in this way and to believe together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The worship team is going to continue uh, to lead us in an extended worship song, so feel free to stay. But at the same time, we'll be having free continental breakfast out on Tiffany Loop, so please join us there as well. <laughs> 